Thank you for joining us on Heritage Events Live. We're delighted to welcome you to a celebration of the 40th anniversary of the Reagan tax cuts. Please welcome our host, Matt Dickerson, Director of the Grover N. Herman Center for the Federal Budget. We hope you enjoy the program. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome everybody to today's event, a celebration of the 40 year anniversary of the Reagan tax cuts. I'm Matt Dickerson, director of the Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget here at the Heritage Foundation. Our team and I focus our research on issues related to taxing and spending. Unfortunately, I think there's been a little too much of both of those going on recently. But we're very excited to be hosting this event, this celebration. The Economic Recovery Tax Act was a, a positive change to tax policy, yes. But it represented much more than that. It was a change in the mindset. The 1970s were a time of high inflation, high unemployment, low on opportunity. Our nation's leaders rejected the idea of American greatness and thought the American dream was behind us. 30 years ago, the Heritage Foundation hosted a celebration for the 10th anniversary of the Kemp Roth tax cuts. It was titled, The Importance of America's Victory Over Washington. Think about that for a second. America's victory over Washington. As the tax cuts were being debated in Congress, President Reagan gave voice to this sentiment in his televised address, reassuring the American people, quote, all the lobbying, the organized demonstrations, and the cries of protest by those whose way of life depends on government's wasteful ways were no match for your voices, which were heard loud and clear. So it's healthy and very important for our movement to celebrate our successes and remember the good things that were accomplished for the country. It's even more important for us to come together and consider the lessons learned and teach the next generations how to apply those lessons to the challenges of today and to the challenges of tomorrow. A retrospective analysis of the, the tax, 1981 tax cuts performed by the, the Tax Foundation found that if IRTA had been allowed to fully stay in place instead of being partially rolled back by later tax hikes, it would have increased the long-run GDP by 8%. 8%, that's a huge number. Think about how good that would have been for the country. Perhaps we should have given that a try. It turns out that if you lower taxes, reduce regulatory burdens, allow people to keep more of their own money, and allow them to make their own decisions about what to do with it, it results in more economic growth, more prosperity, and higher standards of living for the American people. But now, President Biden's agenda adds another major threat to American prosperity and our way of life. They're threatening massive tax hikes, a massive expansion of government control over the most personal aspects of your life. Not to mention, key provisions of the tax code under current law are soon to gonna, going to be expiring. And the tax code is still too burdensome. It's too uncompetitive. And perhaps most importantly, the size and scope of government has grown too unsustainable. It's too costly. It's too harmful. High spending restricts current and future economic growth. It infringes on liberty and has very serious negative effects on people's lives and their liberty. So it's vital that we all work together, rise to meet this moment, and address these challenges head on, just as President Reagan addressed the challenges of his time. In his book, The Age of Reagan, Stephen Hayward made a really interesting observation. He said that one of the things that made the supply side phenomenon so remarkable was that there were so few supply siders. There weren't even enough supply siders to fully fill all the key positions in the Reagan administration. And it's notable that some of the most ardent criticisms of the supply siders came from Republicans. But the supply siders understood the way the world works. And the American people intuitively understand as well. So when President Reagan and Jack Kemp and Art Laffer and Norman Ture and Steve Vinton and all the others harnessed the power of ideas, harnessed the power of principles, and went on offense and spoke the truth boldly and unapologetically, they won. We won. Even the Democrats at the time started talking about the need to reduce tax rates 
in order to help fix the economy. The Heritage Foundation analysis at the time called that a triumph of supply side thought. Unfortunately, too many of today's conservatives are unwilling or unable to argue in terms of the first principles of our true North, as well as President Reagan did. We have truth and justice and fairness and all these great things on, on our side. So let's shout it and talk about it boldly and proudly. And here to do just that, we have a very distinguished and, and, and uh, fantastic lineup this evening that needs little introduction. We will hear remarks from Ed Meese, Attorney General and, and Key Advisor to President Reagan and the Heritage Foundation's Ronald Reagan Distinguished Fellow Emeritus. We'll hear from Art Laffer, Founder and Chairman of Laffer Associates on a, uh, a panel moderated by Larry Kudlow, the host of Kudlow on Fox Business Network. We're going to hear from Heritage Foundee trustee, Steve Forbes, the Committee to Unleash Prosperity, Steve Moore, senior fellow at the Independent Institute, Judy Shelton, and speechwriter to President Reagan, Anthony Dolan. First, I'd like to turn the stage over to my friend and uh, head of the Reagan Alumni Association, Lou Cordia. Lou, thank you. Well, I'm Lou Cordia, Executive Director of President Reagan's Alumni Association, and on behalf of the board, uh, we're delighted to co-host this event with the Heritage Foundation and the Committee for to Unleash Prosperity uh, to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the signing of President Reagan's tax cuts. Uh, we are at a surreal moment. On the one hand, we're talking about the massive Reagan tax cuts, and uh, across, the, across the street in downtown, we have President Biden and the Democrats uh, looking to spend uh, 1.9 trillion, I think it's called the American uh, Rescue Act, 1.2 trillion for infrastructure, 3.5 trillion, and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's terrible where we are now, but let's remember it was terrible at the end of the 1970s and we're because of folks like Reagan, folks like people in this room, and others around the country, uh, we will rebound. I want to take just a couple of minutes to um, um, touch on some of the quotes of Ronald Reagan when he talked about his tax cuts, because it helped position the argument pretty well uh, leading up to it and then talking about it afterwards. Uh, many of you will recall that um, one of the quotes he used often was, government's view of the economy could be summed up in a few short phrases. If it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. And if it stops moving, subsidize it. Another one was, um, the problem is not that people are taxed too little. The problem is that government spends too much. He said, when John Kennedy's tax program, which he said was not too dissimilar from his, was passed, the same thing happened, more revenue at lower tax rates. He said, a taxpayer is someone who works for the federal government, but doesn't have to pass the civil service exam. And he said, our federal tax system is, in short, utterly impossible, utterly unjust, completely counterproductive, it reeks with injustice and is fundamentally un-American. It has earned a rebellion and it's time that we rebel again. A Couple more is he said, if you reduce tax rates and allow people to spend or save more of what they earn, they'll be more industrious, they, they'll have more incentive to work hard and money and keep the money that they earn. It will add fuel to a great economic machine that energizes our national progress. The result, he said, more prosperity for all and more revenue, uh, consequently, for government. There were a few economists at the time that uh, called this principle supply-side economics, and he said sometimes he calls it just common sense. Lastly is one of his more colorful ones when he said, the American taxing structure, the purpose of which was to serve the people, began instead to serve the insatiable appetite of government. And he said, if you will forgive me, you know, someone has likened government to a baby. It is a uh, elementary ca uh, canal with an appetite at one end and no sense of responsibility at the other. 
Well, President Reagan's tax cuts certainly stimulated the economy, created millions of jobs, and got the country out of President Carter's self-described malaise. And speaking of President Carter, I'll, uh, I'll try my own attempt at Reagan-like humor. Let's imagine in 1979 that President Carter was jogging around the tidal basin, and he slipped and fell in and was drowning. Secret Service may be looking the other way, and three 10-year-old boys jumped off his bikes and they saved him. And he says, you know, I'm President of the United States. I'd like to do something for you. First kid says, uh, can I get a tour of the White House? President Carter said, you saved my life. I'll give you the tour myself. Second kid says, well, can I just get a new bike? He said, I'll buy you the best bike there is. You saved my life. I'm President of the United States. Third kid says, as President of the United States, do you oversee Arlington Cemetery? He said, I do. He said, as President, do you have enough power to arrange for me to get a plot there? Yes, I do. But what are you, about 10 years old? Why are you thinking of death? He said, because when I go home and tell my parents I saved, they're going to kill me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear some remarks from uh, Art Laffer. Art. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. That was great, by the way. It's fun being with all of you. Those of you on the panel, I wish I were there. I've got to go up to uh, the mountain tomorrow, up to Rancho del Cielo, where I'm going to be doing hosting that uh, event of the honorary thing for 40 years, and that'll be fun, too. I wish you all were there. Uh, what I just want to say, and I, I don't want to overlook all the other accomplishments of the Reagan administration and what the president did. I mean, for example, coming in and seeing the end of the Iran hostage crisis, the day, the moment he took oath, the oath of office, incredible. That shows the, just the power. We had a joke before he took the oath of office, was what's covered with sand and glows in the dark. And, and the answer was uh, Tehran in about 15 minutes after Reagan takes office. That was a joke. They, they understood the threat from Reagan and they released the hostages as he took the oath of office. I also don't want to underestimate the power of the decontrol of oil. You know, we had all the gas lines, if any of you remember that. Herb Stein said that the limit of the how long a gas line could bet would be uh, how long it took to drive through with one full tank of gas. It could never get any longer than that. And it was pretty <laughs> close to that line. <laughs> it just, and then of course, um, the air traffic controllers, I don't want to underestimate that. That was really powerful as well. You know, as some of you may know, I think it was the air traffic controllers and Ed Meese will correct me if I'm wrong in this, but I think they were the only union that supported us in the Republican primary in 1980. I think they were the only union that supported us in the general election. But even with all of that goodwill uh, towards the administration and from the administration to them, you know, you can't strike against the American people. And Ronald Reagan gave them a firm edict without consideration of, of the favors they did for us and literally fired the air traffic controllers. That's really a powerful thing as well. But I want to focus on the taxes here. And, you know, what you want to look at, and I look at the IRTA as being the first in, uh, installment of a two installment policy. The next one was the 86 Tax Act. Those two together just unleash supply side economics on the economy. It proved that economics, I mean, supply side economics really worked. People respond to incentives and they really do. I was shocked at some of the details of the responses to incentives that occurred uh, with the supply side economics and also with the tax cuts. Uh, to get the bill through how the House and the Senate, uh, President Reagan agreed to phase in the tax cuts. The tax cuts actually began in full in, on January 1st, 1983. It is amazing to me how tax cuts don't work until they take effect. We had the deep downturn in 81, 82, when the tax cuts took effect on literally one minute into 1983, bam, the boom hit. From January 1st, 1983 through June of 1984, an 18-month period, the U.S. economy grew by 12% in real terms. 12% in 18. We grew at an average annual rate of a little less than 8% per annum for a year and a half. I mean, that's Chinese growth rates. It was just amazing what did it. If you look at the whole set of policies there, and I just want to go through them. We had tax cuts. We had sound money. Paul Volcker deserves an enormous amount of credit uh, for the type of policies that he put in in this administration. Even though he was appointed by Jimmy Carter, he did the greatest job effort. You know, you have sound money, tax cuts, free trade, and deregulation, and you'll get the prosperity we had. And that prosperity was wonderful. Uh, I don't understand why Walter Heller, who was the architect of the Kennedy tax cuts, or so he said, why he would be against it when it's almost the exact same thing with Ronald Reagan, but he was. 
He said we'd have hyperinflation. You just tell me, how does supplying more goods to the marketplace cause prices to rise? If you have a bumper crop in apples, the price of apples doesn't go up, it goes down, duh. I mean, you know, and you look at all this situation there, this was a beautiful period, it was simple. Uh, as Larry Gatlin now says, and I'll, I'm gonna turn over to Ed in one second, dear friend, but as Larry Gatlin, Gatlin says, and I'm just gonna quote Larry here, it's all of you know, country Western, and I live in Nashville, because Nashville and Tennessee are the lowest tax states in the nation. I just want you to know I planned it that way. Uh, but Larry Gatlin says, you know, it ain't rocket surgery. It's an economy into prosperity. A poor person can't spend himself into wealth. Uh, you know, Jack Kennedy put it so beautifully, the best form of defense spending is always wasted whenever you find yourself in a situation where you need your military hardware and prowess. That is a clear sign that you did not spend enough. Reagan understood all of these policies, put them all together, created the greatest prosperity ever. And I am so proud I was able to work with him. Um, I, I just loved it. Uh, it was terrific. And now I want to give you the dean of all deans of the Reagan period, uh, my dear friend. And I, man, I wish could be up there in the Rancho Del Cielo with me tomorrow, Ed. But Ed Meese is the hero's hero. Ed, the show is yours. Thank you, Art. Great, great job as usual, Art. I want to know, you to know how happy I am to be with you and my friends here today on this program. This was a very important day for the country when the tax cut was announced and the legislation set, signed in 1981. And an important day for the presidency for Ronald Reagan, as you've related, that was really the crux of getting things started and getting the country back again. <clears throat> but there's one person who's not here today with us, unfortunately, and that's Martin Anderson. Martin passed away a number of years ago, but he was very instrumental back in 1979, 1980. He had been with Ronald Reagan during the campaigns for the presidency of both 1976 and 1980. And uh, it was at that time, as you point out, our country was in deep trouble. We were in the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And uh, in the transition, Ronald Reagan asked Martin Anderson to come up with a strategy for how we could get the country back on track. <clears throat> so uh, Martin went to work. Art, he definitely had your ideas in mind when you illustrated supply side economy by I believe drawing a design on the back of a cocktail nap napkin. I think that's, that's that's somewhat significant. I think of what your work was and how well you did it, because you were able to to explain a fairly complex subject in a very very simple and a very illustrative way. <clears throat> and so Martin Anderson went to work, having been charged by the president. For this time, the president elect at that time with this task. He came to the president with a four point strategy, which he related to him in the transition, I believe it was the end of December, start of January 1981. And uh, there were four points, some of you, which you've already talked about today. One, of course, was the tax cut, the second was regulatory reform, the third, was maintaining stable monetary policies. And the fourth was slowing the growth of federal spending. Each of these was important, but the tax cut was absolutely significant <clears throat> because this was the one that mainly showed the American people how they individually and through their families would be able to benefit from the new policies of this administration. And so the tax cut was put into effect when Ronald Reagan signed the legislation on the 12th of, of, uh, of uh, August, 1981, there in the porch of the ranch house at, at the, his ranch, Ranch of Del Cielo. And this was a day which I'm glad that today we're able to celebrate 48 years showing actually, as you point out, that conservative ideas and particularly conservative economic ideas work. 
I'm sure the panel that will be speaking later on today <clears throat> will describe this in more detail. But the challenge, of course, was once the plan was, was enacted, was to get it passed by the legislature. And that's why this day itself was so important. But the challenge then after that was to make sure that these tax, tax cuts could be continued. There was a big move in 1982 because as you point out, Art, the, uh, the whole program had not yet taken effect, so the impact hadn't been fought. <clears throat> we still had some major economic problems in 1982, and many people talked about jettisoning the tax cuts. Ronald Reagan stood firm, and I can remember being with him in the Oval Office when he told those who would try to do away with the tax cuts uh, that he was going to stand firm, and there was no way they were going to be able to, to change or modify or destroy the, this significant foundation for the economic recovery that then began. And as you point out, Art, that was the start when it finally took effect. That was the start of the longest period of peacetime economic growth in the history of the country. And that's why it's appropriate that we, were, that we uh, commemorate uh, that day when the legislation was signed, it's important actually that we remind people of the benefits that the country derived from that economic strategy. And it's important to remind legislators today and the national leaders for the future that tax cuts and low taxes is the keynote of a successful economic program and that an economic success for our nation. So it's a pleasure to be with you all today, to see a lot of good friends who will be speaking later on, and to commemorate what Ronald Reagan did, and also to remember Martin Anderson, who was instrumental with all of those who are here today in making this happen. Thanks. I appreciate the privilege to be with all of you and to help you celebrate an important day. Thank you. Ready? Yeah, you want. Now, if you're ready. Sure. The floor is yours, Larry. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can pass those forward too. Anyway, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Meese. It's wonderful to hear your voice. Thank you for what you just said. I don't know who else is out there. Uh, Art Laffers spoke out there. We just had them all on the TV show. In fact, it's a repeat of the panel, except for Judy and uh, Tony Dolan. So, are you all introduced and? Not yet. Everybody knows Tony Dolan, who was a Reagan speechwriter. Chief speechwriter, speech excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Some things never change. Um, he get into that. also winds up bumping around the Trump White House, if you can believe that. <laughs> there are only a few of us left who served in both of those places, but I insisted that he come here. Uh, I don't think he knows anything about the economy, but he has great stories <laughs> to tell about other things. Uh, my dear friend Steve Forbes, the head of Forbes Media, longtime leader in supply side and politics and communications, who was just a bedrock uh, man of great, great principles. My brother, Steve Moore. Uh, similarly, we've been in the middle of just about every insurrection you can imagine uh, here in Washington and elsewhere. I think I see Ann Moore out there someplace. Hello, Ann. Take a bow. Uh, Jimmy Kemp. She's been married to Steve all these years. She deserves a hand just for that alone. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to get punchy after the uh, TV show. Uh, and Judy Shelton, uh, great monetary expert, great friend of ours, um, advisors to both the Reagan people and the Trump people, and many in between, also a steadfast uh, person of great principle. So... Um, I want to begin with one of the thoughts that Steve Forbes mentioned on our show a few moments ago, which I think is so very important, and that is the relationship between economic strength at home and national security military strength abroad. Sometimes it's characterized as weakness at home, weakness abroad, but I think it's more properly characterized as strength at home and strength abroad. The one leads to the other, to some extent, it's um, 
It's uh, perhaps less understood or underrated as a factor. But Steve, you mentioned it on our show, as you always do, and I wanted you to talk a bit about that, because America was um, on the defensive in the 1970s, um, maybe long before that, but certainly in the 70s. Uh, we forget the strength of Soviet communism. Uh, we forget the fact not only did the Soviets have Eastern Europe and so forth, but they were infiltrating our own hemisphere, uh, not just in Cuba, but also in places, uh, you know, south, littered throughout South America. And that all changed during the Reagan years. And why don't you take it from there? Because I, I think in some respects, in the grand sweep of history, that may be the most important impact of Ronald Reagan. Well, that's right. Not only did his uh, programs, the two big tax bills, which Art mentioned, conquering the inflation, which set off an extraordinary boom, uh, we mentioned it on the show, but between 1983 and 1990, the sheer growth, the real growth of the U.S. economy, the growth alone exceeded the entire size of the German economy, then the third largest in the world. That's just, we grew Germany wow. in seven years. Wow. An amazing achievement. Wow. You, Silicon Valley became a byword for cutting-edge high technology. So the U.S. went from the malaise of the 1970s when it looked like that our best days were behind us, uh, that we couldn't compete again, that we're going to fall behind, and we had to keep temperatures down at 55 during wintertime, uh, to, 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 to a nation uh, that was uh, really on, 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 the, on bestriding the world. And the amazing thing is, after those tax cuts, 50 nations around the world imitated those cuts. And uh, so you had a global, global boom. But relating to what Larry said, in the 1970s, especially in the demoralized aftermath of the Vietnam War, after the hubris of the late 60s, and by the way, uh, Amity Schley's book on Great Society uh, chronicles uh, that uh, terrible uh, time in the late 60s when we lost our way. But in the 70s, we faced the aftermath of it. And as Larry pointed out, in uh, Central America, Nicaragua fell. And look like other countries are going to go uh, uh, the Soviet way. In Africa, Angola and Mozambique with Cuban mercenaries, they were falling and, and fell. And in Europe itself, the Soviets put in missiles, short-range missiles, to really destroy NATO, which was the alliance that enabled us to win the Cold War ultimately. But the, the, the whole battle of a Pershing mer mi missiles, nobody remembers it today, Larry, but that was so important because the Soviets figured if they had short-term missiles aimed at Europe, the Europeans would no longer trust the U.S. to defend them if there was a nuclear attack because we wouldn't risk the utter destruction of the United States. So it was key that we get short-term missile stationed in Germany, which, no surprise, was fiercely resisted by the Soviet Union. They ginned up opposition in Germany and elsewhere. But thanks to the strength, the evident strength of the United States in the early 80s became apparent. We were on the march again, that we are uh, the uh, nation of innovation and confidence and growth that we had been in the 50s and 60s. That was back again. That enabled Chancellor Sh uh, Helmut uh, Kohl, Schmidt before him, to believe the U.S. was going to be there. And so the missiles got in, and the great Soviet gambit to win the Cold War ended. So... Uh, a strong economy means a strong country. Doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. But the world wants a strong leader, a civilized leader, one that uh, believes in human freedom. So all the complaints you get from Europeans and others about the U.S., uh, they fear the U.S. not being strong in the world. And in Asia, whoever would have thought the Vietnamese would be begging us to have aircraft carriers visit to, uh, as, as a counter to the pressure from China. And so we, we play that unique role. And all you have to do, Larry, is look at the 1930s when the U.S. was weak, wracked by the Great Depression, and where we nearly lost civilization. The 1970s, when if these bad policies had continued, uh, they, you, we had soldiers on food stamps for crying out loud. We couldn't even keep our ships in repair. And so it looked like the U.S. was washed up. And suddenly overnight, confidence returns, and by golly, it was a better, richer world. And that's what's so dangerous today. So dangerous today, 
we're making the same bloody mistakes again, and I use the word bloody advisedly, that if the U.S. is seen as weak, and by golly, if Biden has his way with those uh, entitlements and everything else, weak dollar, uh, we're going to have a troubled period again, and hopefully we can turn it around. But this is why this panel is so important, and others like it, is remind people that can be turned around Let's turn it around and not repeat the same mistakes again. Because it's not just GDP. It's about the safety and morale of a free and civilized society. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Steve Moore, one of, the, one of the thoughts here is that when Reagan started to negotiate, meet and negotiate with Gorbachev, I mean, the issues were um, disarmament, missiles, but of course, Gorbachev wanted the Gipper to give up um, Star Wars, in effect, Brilliant Pebbles, uh, which, you know, t today, by the way, is a bastion of our defense, uh, provided we, we keep it up. But Steve, when those guys met, it just occurs to me, and I think many others, that Gorbachev was facing a guy who along with his country, had literally delivered the goods to the citizen. Whereas in the Soviet Union, they couldn't deliver the goods. The system had, in effect, self-destructed, as Reagan himself predicted uh, would happen. And it was happening in the mid-'80s by the time. Our recovery was off to a flying start. Reagan, in effect, unleashed capitalism, unleashed free enterprise, uh, took the cuffs off lowered taxes, minimized regulations, deregulated oil, which, as I recall, dropped to 10 or $12 a barrel at one point by the mid-'80s. So Gorbachev couldn't match that. He could not match that because his economic system uh, didn't work and ours did. So you and I have penned this op-ed that will be in the paper the, tomorrow, the, the journal, about the, the growth rates and so forth. Today, today, I think we're in danger of re-handcuffing free enterprise and capitalism. Uh, as Dan Clifton has uh, noted in a recent piece, these are the first tax hikes on capital, right, the geese that laid the golden eggs, on capital in 50 years. And I find that to be um, foreboding, certainly moving in the wrong direction, and will certainly damage us in the eyes of the rest of the world. What do you think? Is that for me or for Steve? It's for you. Okay. Uh, You're not getting but, off. Uh, <clears throat> so let me just shout out a couple. So there's so many great people in this room. I just wanted to uh, say that the, the Reagan tax cuts not, would not have happened without Richard Ron. Richard, you were a superstar. Uh, you were, at that time, uh, I think chief economist at the Chamber of Commerce, when the Chamber of Commerce was good. <laughs> and uh, thank you for what you did, because you were a driving force behind that. Uh, and then Grover Norquist, I don't know, Grover, if you had the tax pledge back then, but I think that what Reagan did certainly gave, gave birth to that movement and, uh, and held Reagan from being succumbed into you know, agreeing to tax increases. And so that was incredibly important. And, and others, and by the way, Judy, you should be the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board because yes. you are the top <laughs> monetary economist in the country. Um, by the way, I tried. <laughs> Very hard. Uh, and so um, I, I wanted to mention two other people because it's just such a great, great day. It's a great day to remember what happened. Uh, the great Robert Bartley, Bob Bartley. And I don't think it would have happened without, for those of you who don't, uh, remember, Bob Bartley was the editorial page editor of the Wall Street Journal, and I think about every day they were had editorials explaining and teaching the American people about why this was so important. And of course, Jude Wineski, who was uh, was at the editorial page at that time, and and really, I think he was he the one who supply who, who came up with the term supply side economics, or I, I don't remember, but he, he certainly um, it was Herb Stein. Pardon? It was oh, Herb Stein. Stein. Called it supply side Believe economy. it or not. Yeah. So, uh, so that was all cool. Um, I'm going to just say one quick thing that I, I think we are in a danger zone right now because none of the lessons that we should have learned over the last 40 years seems to me have been learned by the left, and that that's troubling to me. Uh, that only you know one thing you said on the show today, Larry, 
what you said that it was a Reagan, you know, um, <clears throat> revolution was a 30 year revolution. I'd, I'd say it was a 40 year revolution. I mean, you know, obviously Trump borrowed a lot of those ideas from Reagan as well. And I'm going to give you all one statistic that's in our Wall Street Journal <clears throat> op ed tomorrow, but it's, it's just incredible when you think about this that 40 years ago today, give or take 100 points or so, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 1,000. 1,000. Today, 40 years later, the Dow is at 35, not 3,500, 35,000. This is the greatest period of wealth creation in the history of civilization. We've never seen anything anywhere in the history of the world that comes close to what has happened in the United States. And it wasn't just the tax cuts. It was, as Steve Forbes pointed out, it was the deregulation. It was the you know, sound money policy, clearly. Uh, it was the move and march towards free trade uh, and, and limiting government. And now we are seeing um, you know, Biden and not just Joe Biden, but the left in America has, has not learned any of the lessons from these things. And you know, that troubles me because I do worry that if we start t turning these dials back to where they were in the 70s when we did have 60 and 70 percent tax rates. I mean, Elizabeth Warren talks about all this all the time. That's what we should go back to. Larry, they want to re-regulate the airlines and the railroads. I mean, come on, how stupid is that? I mean, that, that, if there's any ever a success, it was right deregulating the airlines and the, and the energy markets and the railroads, and they want to go back to the policies that we had. So, you know, one of the reasons we put this whole thing together, and by the way, thank you to Heritage for doing a great job in getting this, and thank you all, you, all of you for being here and braving COVID uh, to be here. Um, I, I think it's really important that this lesson be taught uh, in schools and in universities and uh, what Reagan did for our country and how, you know, if we keep these rates low, we can have another 40 years, Larry, like the previous 40 years. I, I really believe that. And we will be an unrivaled superpower. China will only catch us. Last point I'll make. China is only going to catch us if we make, if we allow the, the po if we do it to ourselves, right? If we reverse our own policies, because China will not whip us if we keep our tax rates low and let America you know, succeed as it has for the last 40 years. Uh, Judy Shelton, we talked a lot about the mix, the policy mix of um, low tax rates and a strong dollar, or low tax rates uh, and tight money. That was how Mundell used to characterize it in his shorthand. So we don't have that now. We sure don't have tight money now, and we're probably not going to have low tax rates, although we will see how that legislative argument plays out. But in your judgment, um, did Reagan work well with Volcker? Uh, was the Laffer, what was called the Laffer-Mundell hypothesis, in play at that point, either consciously uh, or not? Well, first let me also express my thanks for being with you all. Um, I feel very grateful to be on this panel with my heroes. Um, I didn't serve in the Reagan administration, but my first job as a newly minted uh, doctoral uh, person was um, to be a research assistant to Martin Anderson. Wow. So I, I feel like I brought props with me today. <laughs> uh, and the first, my first project with Martin was he had this pamphlet called an economic Bill of Rights. So I just want to go back and kind of integrate some of the things I've been hearing, which have given such remarkable perspective. Um, as Ed Meese said, uh, Martin wrote the memorandum that laid out the four points. And in this pamphlet, he, he was reflecting on when that. Was this written? Um, 84. 84. And so in he had just left the White House, mm -hmm. having served as the chief domestic economic policy advisor. So he was saying, what do we do next? And he decided, I think, to, to get reinvigorated at a think tank out at the Hoover Institution. But in here, he said, in the summer of 79, Reagan's approach to resolving the economic malaise of the 70s was spelled out in that internal memorandum that became the basis for the policies of his 1980 campaign and the economic recovery program there were the four basic parts. The first, control the rate of increase of government spending to reasonable, prudent levels. What we a, need that now. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
The second was to reduce personal income tax rates and to accelerate and simplify business depreciation schedules in an orderly, systematic way to remove the increasing disincentives to work, to save, to invest, and to produce. People respond to incentives. The third was to reform, reduce, and eliminate economic regulations so as to encourage economic growth. So sounding a lot like the Trump administration pro-growth agenda. The fourth was to establish a stable and sound monetary policy. That was the part that to me was, was visionary and, and radical in a sense. And you're right, Larry, as, as you asked me at the outset, did that work? Here you had Volcker who decided that he would try this experiment of targeting monetary aggregates and let the interest rate go wherever it had to go. At the same time, you had the, the pro-growth tax policies, and that was Mundell's magic formula. And it did work. It worked tremendously. It was brutal. It hurt a lot of the economy. But wrenching out the inflation was <clears throat> vital. And I think we went from over 13% in 81 to, what, three or four, two years later. It was astonishing. So um, my other props, <laughs> Jack Kemp, the American idea. What a promoter he was. <laughs> Here's a guy who would sit on the bus going from one football game to the other reading John Maynard Keynes' <laughs> general theory and understanding it. But then I remember, um, and my thanks to Jimmy, who gave me some books from his dad's library, which I treasure. But Jack said, the monetary issue is anything but remote from people's experience. In my experience, honest, sound, stable money is a popular, blue-collar, bread-and-butter, winning political issue, and we see how people are so distressed over this rising inflation. They definitely get the value of stable money, have a sound monetary platform so they can plan and invest and make good decisions dictated by free market mechanisms. Another one, the perfect prop, Bob oh, Bartley, perfect. the seven <laughs> fat years. And he's the one who can I say popularized in the best sense, it helped everybody understand. Um, for me, having studied international monetary systems, Mundell was my personal guru in all of that, but I remember um, in his acceptance speech in 99 for his Nobel, here's what he said, and I think this sums it up. The 70s were a disaster. <laughs> in terms of economic stability, but we learned a valuable lesson. The lesson was that inflation, budget deficits, big debts, and big government are all detrimental to public well-being and that the cost of correcting them is so high that no democratic government wants to repeat the experience. Wow. So I'm very afraid we might be about to, but he warned us. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, in sum on this one, it did work, and they did collaborate, question mark? I think that Ronald Reagan honored the independent judgment. It's true that Volcker had come in under Carter in August 79, and he was there until August 87. But we had the 1981 Goal Commission, mm -hmm. and I think that Volcker understood that people were so concerned about the lax policies of his predecessor and Arthur Burns and whether there was some kind of acquiescence to what the White House might want, that President Reagan was very respectful. But it turned out that what Paul Volcker thought he had to do to wrench out the inflation happened to be exactly in compliance with what Mundell said we ought to be doing mm -hmm. in order to have the pro-growth tax policies expand economic output. Mm -hmm. And the, the combination of low tax rates and sound money, I mean, I, to me, that's the most important lesson uh, to be learned. So look, um, I was a young kid then in OMB 
I did sit in on one of those Volcker meetings, thanks to Mr. Meese, by the way, who would include me. Reagan and Volcker had something in common. Gold. Gold. I mean, Volcker was the last guy. Volcker was defeated when Nixon went through what he went through in the early 70s, and Volcker was the undersecretary of the Treasury at that time. Volcker did not want to delink the dollar from gold. He, he wanted to make some minor price adjustments to the gold link, but not to end it. I don't know about Burns. Burns, I've heard both ways of this thing. I know Volcker. I know him very well. I was once his executive assistant at the New York Fed. And I think Reagan, like those guys, saw things similarly. The rest of Reagan's senior staff didn't like Volcker and tried to push him out and eventually succeeded in 1987. Um, whether that was a mistake or not, I don't know. Greenspan came in. I thought did a pretty good job, maybe until the very end. But I always thought those guys were in Zapatico. I really did. I could be wrong. No, no, I think you're exactly right. And um, and Volcker took no prisoners. He's like Reagan. Reagan used to say, "I will war let, leave the politics to me." He used to always say that about a lot of debates, and that was one of them. So don't you do what you have to do, right. and I'll take the political heat, which I thought was fabulous. It was fabulous in a lot of other ways. And I want to bring my pal Tony Dolan uh, into that. Uh, as I said, Tony. Um, you know, has more reading to do on the economic side. But <laughs> the benefit and the brilliance is, as a speechwriter and as a creative guy and an intellectual and an ideas guy, what was Reagan thinking? What was he thinking, especially in 81 and 82, Tony Dolan? Well, I mean, I don't want to offend you, but I'll begin with some numbers that should, have, should appeal to you. <laughs> really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. We were facing 22% interest rates. We were facing 8% unemployment and back-to-back -back, uh, double-digit inflation two years in a row, the first time since World War I. We also were facing 18% increases in federal spending. Ronald Reagan came into office, said, no, we're going to stop. Tip O'Neill said, you're in the big leagues now. We're going to teach you a few lessons. He went on the air, and everything changed. Ronald Reagan, uh, soon Bill Sapphire came up with the perfect uh, – uh, label for him and brand name, but it also helped the media assimilate. Yes, that's right. Reagan had this video magic, this televised trance he could put people in. And so he was the great communicator. They were quoting, Larry, uh, Tip O'Neill again when this bill came up. And, they, Tip, and the reason they were doing it is because he said, I have a 20 vote cushion on this. We're going to defeat it. And uh, Reagan did what he had done prior. Uh, with the economic speeches. And by the way, Marty Anderson did the audit that was based on, and I'm so grateful to Ed for bringing him up, but <laughs> I must tell you, Reagan wrote those speeches. Mm. And mm. Um, uh, they were his view. He'd been talking about this forever. And it's the same thing. He called up Pete Hannaford in the 70s and said, Pete, have you seen this Kemp Roth tax cut bill? <laughs> and yeah. And so they did a script together, and he insisted on it. And no one thought Reagan was going to run for president again at this time. So um, uh, uh, even then, his advisor said, Governor, are you sure you want to be that far out on something like this? And he had to fight for it in the campaign. As we all know, Barbara Conable was a great guy, but he was, as somebody said, losing his mind watching Jack Kemp on Meet the Press talk about tax cuts. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob Dole, I gave a copy of Wealth and Poverty to Reagan to, so he could give it to Bob Dole, and he was quickly in the, in, the, uh, in the hospital. But uh, these were things, every one, Larry, every one of uh, the CEA chairman told me over lunch, where you and I used to commune as well in the staff table, that Ronald Reagan knew economics as well as anyone they knew. In fact, Murray Weedenbaum said, you know, he knows our bag of tricks. Mm -hmm. He's got it down. Mm -hmm. And, and I, want to, I want to emphasize, we sent two drafts in for this speech, mm -hmm. the one that changed everything. And uh, Tip O'Neill was laughing. All of Washington was laughing. Mm -hmm. And Mike Deaver said, you know, the president was very pleased with the drafts. And I said, well, Mike, he ought to be. Uh, it was all his stuff. Um, <laughs> for three months, he'd been talking about this bill. And he'd been talking about it in informal situations and formal ones. Ben Elliott, who was a terrific supply side believer, he could, Ben could handle any speech, but in particular, he was a si supply side true believer. He did a uh, draft that had uh, terrific descriptions 
of what was going on. And again, part of the conservative speechwriter, Reagan White House ethos, we plagiarize Reagan and then we get to take the credit for his speeches. But uh, <laughs> I set one in that was something I'd worked on in the election eve speech when we blocked the uh, half an hour uh, 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 period of time uh, on all three networks. It was just the setup. It was, okay, folks, the breakthrough has to come now, and it's up to you. And he, if you go read the speech, and there was a critical moment. One of the congressmen came in, and um, uh, they let me be there when, remember, Reagan got this through a Democratic House and a very reluctant Republican Senate. And one of the congressmen said, the Democrats at the last minute came up with their own tax cut, and this was going to finally do Reagan in. And one of the congressmen said, you know, Mr. President, I, uh, I was up uh, talking to a farmer the other day, and I explained to him our tax cut bill and how it was going to do just fine, and it was okay, and, and, and I went into all the involved discussions about it and so forth, and finally the farmer just looked at me and he said, Congressman, are you for him or against him? And he said, Mr. President, I'm voting for you. And he tells the story, it's there in the, uh, in the speech. But think of what happened because Ronald Reagan had this vision of the economic uh, world that he did. And where did it come from? Hello, Frederick Hayek. Mm. Uh, he believed in beneficent forces. Mm. He believed that as calamitous as our world is, if you, <laughs> beauty, truth, and uh, goodness still has power. And what he was saying, really, he understood paradoxes. He understood you cut taxes to raise revenue. He understood that you confront a criminal regime in order to make it conciliatory. Mm. And how to get it, I'll just finish up with this. And if you want, I can tell you a story about the rehearsal. It was very funny, a back and forth he was doing uh, with his TV director. But uh, I'll, I'll finish with this. Uh, he understood paradox, ambiguity, and mystery, uh, the mystery of not the fatal conceit, as, as Hayek put it, the idea that the oligarchs, the philosopher kings, know better. No, it's this mysterious force. The democracy works better because people uh, make a better corporate decision than the oligarchs. Mm. And similarly, lots of people don't know each other. Making economic decisions in billions of transactions mm. do way better than the government mm. panels. <laughs> so I have to tell you, that's the reason Ronald Reagan believed in supply side and believed that if you if you really stood up for the truth, it had ontological power. Why? Because his mom had told him the Bible, and he believed in the Judaic Christian paradigm, and he believed that if you just uh, had a little trust in chariots, uh, you could uh, uh, change the world. And uh, that's what I'd leave you with. This was a remarkable intellect, uh, as well as a remarkable communicator. And he. He actually did use numbers in his speeches. Oh, he loved numbers. Yeah. Loved numbers. Love them. That's a lost art. Yeah. Cause a lot of these politicians today will tell you, or their advisors will tell you, oh, nobody listens to numbers. The eyes glaze over. Well, listen it's to not his, good. Larry, listen to the speech, the 64 speech. Uh, he always used yeah, numbers. He, he died to death. In fact, he used, he used on-camera charts, graphs. Totally. On and camera, which was very cool. You want the story or not? Sure. Yes. Oh, okay. Gotta have it. Okay. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be able to stop you anyway. So no, go exactly. Ahead. <laughs> but it's about the charts. I'm not kidding. Go for the charts. All right. By the way, you've picked your whole game up on the economy. I'm proud of you. Yes, yeah, so that's okay. Well, <laughs> I'm your student, Larry. <laughs> this is this is just good. get my title right next this time. This is good. So, but uh, <laughs> in any case, he's he's rehearsing. Uh, somebody very uh, and we had the script down and it was fine. He'd gone through it once. And uh, somebody, you know, White House aides, they always got to fix stuff. And I'm ready to, it's probably somebody like Larry. And uh, was it you? I can't remember. Anyway, he said, no, we want to make a change. It was me. Yeah, OK. But no, it wasn't. It was Gergen. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, he had a wonderful director, Mark Good. And yes. what Reagan knew was that yes. live TV, anything can go wrong. Talk about calamity. So you better do it right. And Mark went up to him and said, Mr. President, uh, we want you to go to the uh, chart now once and then go back to the text and back to the chart. But we've only rehearsed it. At, you just pointed to the ch chart once. Can you handle this? And uh, the president just kind of looked at him and, uh, uh, and didn't say a thing. And uh, I realized there was something going on here between director and the artiste. 
And he said it again, well, Mr. President, could you handle this? Could you do this? And, and then f finally, one more time, Mark said, uh, Mr. President, can you do this? And I realized what was happening. He was giving Reagan his chance to tell a story. So he pushed himself back. He said, fellas, I made a film with Wallace Beery. I can handle anything. <laughs> and I said, we all laughed hysterically, but only Mark knew why we were laughing so hard. So the, to my credit, the next time I asked him, I said, Mr. President, what do you mean by that? He said, well, listen, there was a, there was a saying in Hollywood, never make a film, uh, do a scene with a, a little a little dog, a little kid, or Wallace Beery. And then he said, I, I was, it was my scene. I was the only one on camera. Wallace was to my left, he, but I was the only one with any lines. He said, by the end of that uh, scene, do you realize I was, Wallace was the only thing you could see, and I was off camera talking to the back end of the horse, and I, it was supposed to be my scene. And <laughs> that's my point. He, he understood that, uh, and by the way, this is exactly what happened. They were always prepared. Mark at one point had to crawl across the Oval Office with the pen and with hold the pen, the pen up so it, now my marker's working again because the lights had dried it out. But that was the point. Ronald Reagan knew set in force. Um, and he could handle it. Exactly. He and when he did anything. it, and let me finish on this, just that, <laughs> let me finish this one line. He, when he gave a speech, there were no theatrics. The great communicator just let the words and the sentences and the ideas do the work. Speak for themselves. Steve Forbes, the benefits of Reagan's optimism. That's almost a lost art. There are few people who are optimists, who believe as bad as things may be, they can be turned around. As big as the Soviet Union was and powerful, it could be brought to its knees. As awful as the US economy he inherited, it could all be changed in a year or two. And he was the quintessential optimist. How important was that? Well, it was a critical because people can be optimistic and depress people. Uh, Neville Chamberlain uh, was an optimist in early 1940 before the German offensive, yeah. but uh, didn't inspire people that uh, the situation was well in hand. Yeah. What made Reagan's optimism believable was one that he believed it, it just wasn't a show or, you know, let's put a merry face on but also a profound understanding of what made America unique. And that while times and circumstances change, free people will find a way to overcome the obstacles and move ahead uh, because people come from the most unlikely backgrounds and do great things in commerce and elsewhere. So it was that profound faith, deeply read, as has come out here, this was not some guy just read a line and then went on to the next thing, and people sensed that even if the elites didn't. And so they believed, yes, we can see through this thing. And also what made the optimism enduring was that when he went through a very rough period from 1981, when the bill was signed, the economy crashed into recession, took beating in congressional elections, People thought the economy wouldn't do much in 1983 and he was going to be in jeopardy. His poll numbers went down, I think, about 35%. But people stuck with him, even though they may have disapproved, because they figured there's something there. And that's why he rebounded so quickly. The economy rebounded quickly, but he was up in the 60s by the time 1984 rolled around, carried 49 out of 50 states, as Art uh, pointed out would have been uh, 56 out of 57. Obama once thought there were 57 states, <laughs> but, uh, but he, he, he would have done that. But the, thing is, but the thing is, it was grounded in an understanding that gave people confidence this had a real wellspring, like it did with Churchill, that as bad as things are, there was a wellspring there that you can trust. That's the key word, trust. They could trust them. I often thought, <clears throat> I often thought, in those difficult, those are tough years. You're exactly right. We lost, I don't know, 25 seats in the House in November 82. The economy was in recession. We didn't get the roaring recovery in early 82 that, um, that Don Regan and, and all of us were hoping for. But um, I often thought as the tax debate uh, came upon the White House, you had a faction of senior advisors who wanted to back off the tax cuts. And Reagan refused. Very important 
uh, I, I was a witness to it, but I'm just saying it occurred at the highest level. And also, with respect to his um, tough, hard line with the Soviet Union, there was really only one guy among the senior policy staff in the White House who believed, A, you had to throw diplomatic shackles aside and be brutally tough with the Soviet Union with respect to their flaws and their vulnerabilities and the U.S.'s um, you know, new position of strength. And then, B, there was really only one person among his senior policy people who truly believed, I mean truly believed, that the Soviet Union uh, would and could be overturned and defeated into the, um, the ash heap of history. That was Reagan. He was the only senior policy guy. And I saw this. Uh, I watched it. I can't say I participated in it. I was those guys against the wall, not at the table. But he was there, and he was unyielding. And they came very close, Steve Moore, in 82, to overturning the tax cut policy. You heard Mr. Meese say how central that was to the whole thing for a variety of reasons. Right? If, you, if you're a tax cutter, you're not likely to be a big spender. If you're a tax cutter, you believe in people, not government planners and bureaucrats and, you know, Ivy League scientists and so forth. So it meant a lot. And most of his senior staff, not all, but many of them, big shots, Steve Moore, wanted to change the tax policy because they sort of, it was more than worshiping at the shrine of the budget deficit, which was an old Republican problem. They didn't really care about growth. They didn't care about the blue-collar workers uh, that Tony was uh, correctly talking about, that Reagan believed in. Reagan himself was a, a blue-collar background. They were afraid of the politics of, oh, the polls. And Reagan just pushed it aside. He would take the political rap, but he wanted to do the right thing. That's an extraordinary leadership position, Steve Moore. Extraordinary. Yeah, I, I remember in, in 82, uh, you know, that there was so much pressure, you know, to to uh, accede to this giant tax increase. And thank God, <laughs> thank God that he didn't cancel the last. I think one of the things that the, uh, that the Congress wanted to do was cancel the last leg of the tax cut. Is that right, Steve? Yes. That would have been disastrous. You know, we wouldn't have gotten the full thrust of the of the tax debate. I mean, it took a lot of courage. I couldn't agree with you more for Reagan to withstand that. Now, he did pass, they did pass a tax increase, but it was thankfully much smaller. And also the rate cuts stayed in place. Okay. That's, that's right. right. And, bra right. and bracket creep. That's right. And, and, and the indexing of, of the code. Yeah. And then, you know, the to, to then do what they did in 86 was a really incredible accomplishment. They take, you know, Reagan comes in, the top tax rate is 70 and 50 percent to get it down to 28 percent was, you know, you always talk about this 15 and 28. Boy, would, how great would that be if we could go back to 15 I, and 28? I was 28? talking to Milton Friedman at the time, and he said, I can't be, I thought he was going to walk naked into the sea and die. He was so excited because he said, I did this column for Newsweek, and in the, I think it was the early 70s, just to start an argument on the flat tax. He said, Reagan's rates are only three points higher than what I was trying to start an argument <laughs> for. And right. uh, he, the man was in ecstasy. And this was, it, and Larry just emphasized what you said. This started the whole thing with, with the economic miracle. The Cold War was over. Uh, uh, um, uh, trade barriers fell down. A billion people were lifted out of poverty. Uh, all because of what happened 40 years ago uh, uh, this day. And um, it, that was the sine qua non. You know, Judy uh, Shelton, some of that groundwork was laid in the PATCO strike. I think a lot of people have forgot about that. The Air Traffic Controllers Union, which had endorsed Reagan during the campaign, there, you know, it's a, shall we say, an upper middle class union. I mean, pilots make a lot of money and so forth and so on. Not everybody, but the pilots did. But they went out on strike. Reagan said, don't do it. I'm going to fire you. They didn't believe it. So they went out and he fired him. Now, I always felt for domestic purposes, but also international purposes, that was a uh, shot heard around the world. I thought that was fearless and unique coming from a politician. So I guess that's the definition of leadership. And um, you're so right. And when you mentioned this optimism, believing in what he knew in his heart and having the integrity 
to fight for it and carry it out. Um, that, I think, is so important, that faith in the future. Um, I always look at things from a monetary point of view, and I think, what have we been doing to savers who put money in a bank account and they get zero? How does that support the idea of you sacrifice today because it's a financial seed corn that's going to be invested productively and it's going to lead to higher standards of living and everyone benefits and, and you kind of destroy that faith in the future with the monetary policy we've been having or getting negative real rates uh, of interest. What I loved about Reagan, in addition to the strong leadership, was this, this reliance on, on the private sector mm. and his respect for the individual. But it was, it was radical in the sense that it was sophisticated. It was his whole program and all four elements of it were, were international in scope. Um, I mean, it seemed ambitious, but even another book was, this was uh, co-chaired Jack Camp and Robert Mundell in 1983, preceding the Williamsburg G7 conference. They modestly put forward a monetary agenda for world growth. Mm -hmm. But like Thomas Jefferson, they thought the American idea was so wonderful and so blessed, why not extend that to the world? But then they, they had the economic policies to make it work for America. And after I'd worked for Martin, he recommended me for the, the uh, fellowship program, national fellowship at, at the Hoover Institution. I took what I thought would be a very dry subject, the impact of Western capital on the Soviet economy. Mm. So as I started working on that in 85, and then I saw the impact of this just wildly turning around economy in the United States, where we went from being the losers to being having the right, the right message and the, the right mechanisms to turn it into a growth machine, the impact on, on Gorbachev, who just came in in 1985 as Mr. Popular, but Gorbachev was the first one to recognize that the Soviet economy was going the opposite direction the opposite. So I could see that Reagan, by using our ability to invest in the strategic defense initiative, was the maximum leverage. And Gorbachev was, he, he was saying, well, I don't even want you to do research on it. But he knew that the Soviet Union could never match That's that. It. So yeah. my research ended up being a book that came out in uh, January 89, The Coming Soviet Crash. <laughs> so Reagan was right. He saw that country was going bankrupt, and not just economically, morally as well. And Judy, this is important. I was on the plane on the ride back from Reykjavik. It was just like the tax cuts. He said no. Time and Newsweek and the whole world was about to make him the great peacemaker. Mm. And he said, no, I'm going home to Nancy. Mm. And uh, he was being diddled by the Soviets. And the only two people on that plane who were happy, I don't know about Reagan, but it was me and Pat Buchanan, because we knew what had happened. Uh, we knew he had done, and I gave him. <laughs> I think for different reasons you were happy. Yeah, no, no. I gave him a but note. I said, Mr. President, yeah. everybody wanted a treaty. But let me tell you something. Tomorrow, and I, he read it there, and his eyes were actually got filled with tears. I couldn't believe it. But I said, you've done what the American people have always wanted <clears throat> an American president to do. You've stood up to the Russians. Mm. And uh, it was the same courage you point out about the tax cuts at the critical moment. I think that the reason I talked about Patco, first of all, it happened By early. By the way, the Soviets noticed that. That's right. That's where I'm going. Yeah. It, it happened early. Yep. It was like one of those moments. Um, they wrote about it. You think I'm not going to lower tax rates the way I said? Exactly. You think I'm not going to slam down the Soviet Union like I said? You think we're not going to go ahead with our defense bill? Well, watch me. And then this Patco thing comes in. It was a wonderful opportunity. It was like a God-given blessing. And he just hit the bid. He fired him like that had never been done before. In fact, no president has stood up to a labor union like that. And before. all the cables showed and that then, the Soviets were reacting. Right, they and, went crazy. This yeah. is the shot they heard said, around the world. They said, what is this? Who is this guy? The shot heard around yep. the world. I mean, I, and I want to add, in, in terms of inside the administration, yeah. uh, you know, us, the rank and file, it was the greatest thing. Mm -hmm. It was like, wow, wow, he did that. 
It was like, remember what years later you called me when Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord? Oh, that was you the greatest call, moment. You called me. We had this, and <laughs> that it was, was the like, greatest moment. Wow, I mean, it was he one actually of did things. that. He yeah. actually said he was going to do it, and he actually did it. And by the way, contrast that with what Biden is doing now. Yes. I mean, he goes to the G7, and he's like, you can have this, we'll give you this, we'll give you that. I mean, he's just... No, no, he's begging... We're going to decapitate our energy industry, and... He's begging you know, Saudi Arabia to produce oil. Exactly, please. That stupid how, son of a bitch. How, how can he... That? He it's doesn't so know <laughs> that we have a lot of oil here. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. Uh, he does know. He really, just doesn't that, want that it to was print a, it. One of the most embarrassing Honestly, moments. Right. It's a <laughs> new low. We have to beg the Saudis right. to increase their oil production. I mean, we have more oil than any other country in the we, world. By the way, Stephen and I, we do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, we just, that's the way our phone calls go. But that's why I thought it was so incredibly important. Now, I want to go. Can uh, I ask Tony one just quick question? Sure. Because he's on a roll right no, now. Sure. Is it true <laughs> that Reagan, that the, that the speechwriters didn't want to let Reagan say, Gorbachev, tear down this wall. What is the story? Oh, I mean, I, you're, folks, you're... Oh. Yeah, no, oh. I'll, I'll be quick, Larry, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a hard break I've coming. heard a lot of versions, so... There's I'll, no, I'll tell you exactly break. what happened. I want you to keep that in mind. <laughs> it was early, I said to him, Mr. President, uh, you know, it's really early on Berlin. I just was wondering, it was right at the end of a meeting, people were looking at staring daggers. And I said, do you have any thoughts at all about what you might want to say in Berlin? And he did his... Ronald Reagan imitating Rich Little doing Ronald Reagan. He went, <laughs> <laughs> went, well, yes, tear down the wall. And that's how it happened, folks. And I'll tell you, everybody uh, in the foreign policy community tried to get that line out. Wow. Peter Robinson did a brilliant draft. Yeah. We, we fought uh, like hell for yeah. it. And uh, we went through a lot of revisions, and it came out a bunch of times. And we got it back in. Peter's best there is, moment. It was the, Peter's best moment. Yeah, and there and, and there is there is well, moment. there's an ugly memo about me in the NSC files too, <laughs> saying we have had uh, what, five impassioned conversations with Dolan, and he refuses to, et cetera. So, um, but the the wonderful part about it was. It, was a superb draft, Larry, and uh, Reagan worked it over as, as he would, and it was very much him. But in the final analysis, that was the nature of Ronald Reagan. Everybody wanted it out, and he said, no, I will. And I'll tell you, I wrote this in the Wall Street Journal. If anybody's interested, four little words. It tells the story of the, the morning of the speech. We got a cable from the State Department. But Tom Griscom gave it to me. He was director of communications. And I said, Tom, is that what I think it is? He said, yes. He said, don't pay any attention to it. It was another last minute plea. The wall is going to be there another 20 years. And everyone had brought it to Reagan. It was ultimately his decision. As much as we prided ourselves on all our reptilian movements to keep, to keep, the, uh, to keep the line in, it, uh, they took it to Reagan ultimately. And as you point out, no, no, it was like a verbal Patco. I mean, all these exactly. things yep. at key moments. Yep. At key moments, he towed the line. Exactly. You know, these guys now different presidents. What the, the, we're going to draw a red line through that. You cross that red line, and of course, it always gets crossed. Now, that's one of the reasons we've lost uh, respect for the institution. Reagan upheld his red lines which I think is quite and remarkable. And it's his Judaic Christian paradigm. He thought, well, I'm just going to do the best I but can. But it had, you know, to, to come back to where we began with Steve Forbes's idea of, you know, strength at home, strength abroad. All these decisions sent unbelievable messages to the rest of the world mm -hmm. about American strength and persistence in defense of its uh, ideals. I, I want to ask just a little bit of history here. Um, uh, I'll go to Steve Forbes. Steve. Uh, Ronald Reagan was five times the president of the Screen Actors Guild, a big union, an important union. Uh, how do you think that informed his um, actions, communications, and, and political activities down the road? Well, he uh, learned one about leadership, about uh, you just don't do things on your own. He learned about the communist threat which is uh, soon became taboo. You know, you can't be anti anti. It was anti anti communist, and uh, but he learned that, and learned how invidious it was, and he learned too that he made decisions. He did make decisions that he felt his life might be at stake. Uh, the forces uh, arrayed against him. So he was a New Dealer, Democrat, Union guy. But he never forgot he was there to serve his people, uh, not some other political cause. And fortunately, 
That was reflected in much of the labor movement, George Meany and others. Yes, they wanted more, wanted to organize, all that sort of thing. But they're also very patriotic, unlike the left today. Right. That has been lost. When Lane Kirkland left the AFL-CIO, that was the end of that. But uh, Reagan, while he was a big thinker, I just do want to remind you, he also was very practical. I have to share this story, even though it's utterly irrelevant. Uh, and, and that is, we had him at the office once. He gave a speech, a dinner speech. And he related, he said, if you're the dinner speaker or luncheon speaker, and the desserts on the table, eat it first, because they always ask you to speak when people are having the dessert, and they never save it. So eat it first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Larry, uh, another thing on the Actors Union, he said he said what he'd learned: never sit down at a table unless you're willing to get back up. And speaking of Rita Kubicki. Well, yeah, but <laughs> what did he do? Is this, he was five terms president, sec. He did one thing that had never been done before, and I'm pretty sure not since. He called a strike against there the studio bosses. He did it in college, too. Right. I mean, he yeah. did that. That's yeah. the only strike they've ever had. And in those days, Hollywood was a very closed, you know, monopolistic, Same oligarchical way. place. You had four or five of these moguls running the place. Reagan himself, you know, his future career was very much up for grabs. He was already kind of moving away from it. And he called a strike. And in that strike, he got a lot of concessions, uh, not only for actors, but also, you know, for the screenwriters and the people behind the camera whose pensions were at stake and work rules were at stake. And he just did that. I mean, it's like Patco way before uh, there was a Patco. And I want to also ask, um, it's up for grabs, anyone tackle this, the years he was at GE, he learned about handling unions from the other side. He learned how to be a very tough messenger of free enterprise and free markets and capitalism. He went to all these factories all around the country. The, 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 who was it, uh, John Funyu? Bol Bolwar? Who was the? Emil Bolwar. Right. And there's a fabulous book, and I'll never remember the author because I'm way too old, who, about this experience and what Bolwar right, taught Reagan. And, you know, Judy was talking about sound money helps the blue-collar worker, which was something that Jack Kemp, I think, uh, taught all of us. Reagan learned a lot of that stuff. I mean, we talk about how the GOP now has been become a worker's party, all right? And, and that's a, a lot of Trump's own messaging and, and so forth. Reagan was right there. He was doing his best to fight the establishment. And he learned a lot of that during the GE days. As I said, because in those days they had 100 factories around the country. It's not like today. And he would go and talk to the blue-collar people, argue with them back and forth. And I believe, you know, Reagan was a Democrat. As, as Steve said, he was actually a New Deal Democrat uh, before he became Republican. Uh, the other guy I worked for more recently was a Democrat who then became a Republican. I was a Democrat who became a Republican, and I still to this day believe the best Republicans are former Democrats. <laughs> That's Larry, all. Larry, could I just mention Please jump that, in. that the battle for against um, the Soviet Union uh, in all of its um, all of its attacks on on the human soul and and uh, materially as well as uh, in the heart. Um, was facilitated because of Reagan's ability to work with the union movement, with labor, and labor the solidarity, and yes, yeah, like Walenza, and, and with uh, Pope John Paul II. And, um, but um, Lane Kirkland was extremely helpful. Yes. So I think the fact that Reagan had such credibility that workers knew he was really on their side, and he understood how American principles really helped give opportunity to, to the little guy. Well, they, and what a message that would be to communists. And Kirkland, uh, I actually got him to know a bit. Uh, I was staffing for the Social Security Commission in the early 80s, the Greenspan thing. Kirkland was on that. Those guys were anti-communists. They were. Those old union guys were anti-communists. And that's what, uh, as Steve Moore said or someone said, you know, that game has changed. The left is just so awful now. The left hates America. Yeah. In those days, the union guys loved America. They just want to stand up for their for their members, and they didn't collect dues in order to you know provide critical race theory in in junior high school. They loved this country, 
and they didn't go around talking about systemic racism, and America is always wrong. So it was a, uh, a very big a very big difference. So I want to just, uh, I didn't have no by, by, idea. By the way, Larry, in, in terms of GE, in Amity Schley's book, Great Society, there's, there are great, great writings on uh, Reagan's education at GE. And again, his humor, when he became a GE spokesman, they turned his house into a, a laboratory of electricity. Everything was electrified, stoves, heating, everything else. But he said, I drew the line when they wanted to do chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Is that in your book, Amity? All right. <laughs> Amity slays everyone. The best, the best of the best. And husband, Seth Lipsky. Um, I want to just, uh, I don't know, our time is probably up. We can't go on forever. But I, I just want to make a, a point. What we have now with the Bidens, the Biden administration, is an attempt to overturn, overthrow, and reverse every single one of the principles we've been talking about this evening. I mean every single one, whether it's taxes or regulations or free enterprise or patriotism or love of America. And as Steve Moore said, the, perhaps the most pathetic thing in a long line of pathetic things I've seen in the last few months, which is killing Biden's polls because the American people are way smarter than folks think, but this business about pleading with Saudi Arabia and OPEC to produce more oil. It's just <laughs> utterly pathetic. You know, here we have the greatest oil and gas business on the planet that was completely unlocked and unleashed by President Trump, where they had discovered new technologies of fracking and horizontal drilling. And the natural gas revolution, which has brought down our emissions by 25 percent <clears throat> since 2005, we're five years ahead of the Paris Climate Accord targets. That had no government assistance. There was no government planning. It was just a bunch of guys who put an old technology to work, which is the brilliance of the private sector. But I want to say we really have to give every intellectual, activism, communications, writing, money, whatever it takes to defeat the reconciliation bill that will come up for a vote, not immediately, but in a couple months. Because embodied in this bill, they are using it as the vehicle to transform America, to transform its values, its culture, its history, and its economy. They have no interest in economic growth. They know damn well that you're not going to tax your way into prosperity. They know damn well that the inflation is rising because of too much spending and the Fed is monetizing, and that's always going to be the big risk. Um, he's already now put it on Jay Powell's head. Y yesterday he said that. He said, you know, well, they'll do it when they think it's appropriate. This is the monetary equivalent of sending Kamala Harris to the southern border on immigration. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to make a personal plea to everybody here. Heritage is so important and such a great place. There's nothing more important than defeating reconciliation. That's all there is to it. Nothing more important. Literally, our, our way of life is at stake, is at stake, and our economy is at stake. And every great principle we're talking about, from optimism to taxes to money to free enterprise to actually upholding promises to abiding by red lines in the sand, will be defeated by the Bidens. And they're actually rather brash about it. And I don't care who's in charge, whether it's AOC or Bernie Sanders or Nancy Pelosi or my suspicion is Joe Biden. Make no mistake, they want to overturn everything we hold dear, everything we hold dear. And so I'm just making a plea. I'll let my panelists each get one last word on whatever topic they want. But that's my thought for the day. Believe me, trust me, the stakes are incredibly high. Last word, Tony Dolan. Well, the clock is ticking. Folks, I, behind his back, I refer to Larry as Larry the Golden Hearted. He is a wonderful, warm, uh, great person who is busy getting people medals of freedom and thinking of others all the time. Uh, that's a dark secret that I. Uh, we'll only share with all of you. Uh, but I, I think the point I would make is uh, Reagan was the author of his own success, and he was a troublemaker. He, mm -hmm. he embraced controversy just like Margaret Thatcher. He knew that's how you move the ball. Um, Steve Forbes. 
Well, Reagan understood America in a way that few presidents have. <clears throat> um, Lincoln did, a handful of others. Amity Schles wrote a book on Coolidge, who did amazingly. Nobody realizes it, mm -hmm. but Reagan did. And that's why he was successful. That's why he had what my grandfather called stick to uh, through uh, setbacks, which are inevitable, and ultimately led to his uh, triumph, even when he had those setbacks. He believed in the uniqueness of this country. And sadly, we have an establishment today, unfortunately, in culture, in politics, and elsewhere, that it has the exact opposite view that this country is a disgrace to humanity. And that's what we're fighting. Battle for the soul of America. Let's not forget it. Steve Moore. So, uh, you know, you mentioned tonight on the TV show that I had uh, worked in 19, late 1987 at Office of Management and Budget under Jim Miller. Remember Jim Miller? Of course. Uh, who was a great, great Reaganite. Uh, and I never really thought a lot of it. You know, I spent seven or eight months. We tried to privatize Amtrak. Wouldn't that be a great thing if rather than spent giving $50 billion more to Amtrak, we privatize this damn r uh, railroad? <laughs> but um, but, but that, that's a typical, by the way, example of the kind of thing Reagan wanted to do, right? Mm -hmm. You know, think of what better tr uh, transportation we have today if we privatized Amtrak. Uh, and so I'm very, I'm actually very proud of that, that I worked for Reagan, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, that, that it's just, uh, if, you know, and my kids, I tell my kids, you work for Ronald Reagan, that is so cool, you know? So, um, but his stature keeps going up. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Over time, Reagan's mm -hmm. stature keeps going up. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, well, last thing I'll say, I mean, I went to, uh, I went out to South Dakota three weeks ago, uh, Rapid City, so I went to Mount Rushmore, and there is room for one more, <laughs> there's room, <laughs> and wouldn't it be amazing if we put Ronald Reagan on that? <laughs> Judy Shelton, last word. Um, I think he proved you really can change the world. You can change the destiny of the world and uh, for the good. For me, the, the 80s started with the privilege of getting to hear about the Reagan program from, from Martin Anderson, from the people who, who created it. But then seeing that, the, the, the consequences of that, juxtaposed against my study of the internal monetary and economic system of the Soviet Union, uh, who, of course, still has the capacity for thermonuclear exchange to destroy everything. And what you saw was that combination of vision and fortitude was able to bring down that nation. I remember when I see John Fun sitting there, I don't know if he remembers, but you once came to visit Gil and me at our home. And you know what you brought us as a little housewarming gift? A piece of the Berlin Wall. Huh. <laughs> so, so that's what. What are those worth now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping it. <laughs> it was. Um, it just shows that ideas are powerful for good or ill, mm -hmm. and um, if you combine that with with the leadership and the integrity and the principles uh, to see it through, it's it's extremely powerful. So I want to thank our great panelists. Uh, I want to thank the Heritage Foundation. I'm Larry Kudlow, yeah. and I'll just say God bless Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. <laughs>